Well, we're studying the book of Job, and tonight we're in one of the most fun sections of this book. We'll be wrapping up the entire study next session. Next session will be the final and concluding session where we will have we will review the book, but we'll with a lot of surprises, because most people believe that the book is all about, you know, why do the innocent suffer? And you'll be surprised to discover that God never deals with that, not, at least not directly. And as you all know, Job has been put through a real tough time. He's lost all his possessions, his family. He's, uh, he's uh, then also lost his health. And uh, all because uh, Satan's trying to get him to lose his faith. And then Satan's most disturbing attack of all are, these, are his comforters. These three guys that I like to call the Ash Heap Trio. Because they're there to comfort him, and all they do is make matters worse with all their arguments. And what makes that section, section so provocative is you can't find fault with the arguments they're using. They're just misapplied. Not, they don't pray for him. They're not applied in love. And we could go, we could dissect that, but we won't bother here. We'll... Then we have this fourth guy show up, this young guy, Elihu, a spirit-filled young man who really is the bridge, in a sense, between these so-called comforters and God himself. And in the last session is when God himself steps in. We're through with all those discourses. The bulk of the book, of course, are all these poetical discourses. But, but God steps in and uh, <laughs> puts down the three comforters. That's why I'm so confident in taking that view. He doesn't put down Elihu, this young man, who was speaking by the Spirit of God, I believe, and preparing the way. But God, out of a whirlwind... That's, that's such an easy phrase, but there is a huge storm and lightning and clouds and whatever where God himself calls them all to task. And he responds to Job by giving him a science quiz. And in chapters uh, you know, 38 and 39, we had this fascinating tour de force through the discoveries of science. And it's astonishing to add up the insights that we have since discovered in science that are hinted at in those 84 questions that uh, God asks. But in this discourse, he talks about 10 animals. Actually, 12. We're going to get the last two. But we've, we've gone through, uh, in various ways, the 10 animals last time. But uh, in the session we're getting into tonight, he is going to talk about two animals that are also a subject of great mystery to many, many commentators on the Bible. What's provocative about these is not just the fact that these are kind of strange creatures, apparently, that he's, God's talking about. But there are 44 verses devoted to these two animals, more than all the other animals put together. So we've got sort of at least a double mystery here. The first mystery, what on earth is God talking about? Tangibly, that is. The second mystery is, why? Are these animals that important? And we're just, you know, plant the seed already that there may be more at issue here than just the physical characteristics of these animals. So let's turn on our receivers and be sensitive to some of this. So we're going to address some interesting questions. When were the dinosaurs on the earth? What's the... First of all, yeah, it's fascinating. That's why... This is a fun chapter because there's somehow all of us, especially kids too, but all of us get fascinated with dinosaurs. Now, I'm using that term in the broad collective sense, the whole collection of these prehistoric creatures. We see them in museums and we have all this nonsense being promoted about them. They lived millions and millions and millions of years ago. That's utter rubbish. That's utter nonsense. It's unscientific. It's certainly not a scientific fact. It's an opinion by some. But uh, we'll, we'll, get, we'll touch upon that as we go. But set that aside, when were they on the earth? They were in Noah's Ark. The big ones? No, no, he's not stupid. <laughs> Babies, little ones. But still, they're on the ark. How do I know? Because they're still around today. That may surprise you. What's the basis for all these myths and legends of dragons throughout the history of man. 
very prominent, of course, in Asia with China and so forth, also throughout Europe. You can't pick up a piece of literature that somewhere in there, there isn't discussion of dragons where someone killed a dragon. Even, it may be in mythology and so forth, but they're all over the place. What's the basis for those? And whatever happened to them, they're all gone. Most of them are. It may surprise you, there's still some around. They have pictures of them. See, dinosaurs did not become extinct millions of years ago. They are mentioned in the Bible. Some of them were alive after the flood of Noah. In fact, they are mentioned here in the book of Job. One reason so many commentators are so mixed up, they try to make them, uh, well, the, the, a, a hippopotamus or an elephant and all that. It doesn't fit the text at all, but that's all they know about. It never occurred to them that God is talking about real animals that just aren't around anymore, at least not very prevalently. Okay. So anyway, let's back up a bit. We're going to be in chapter 4. Let's, take, let's get a review here. You know, it's interesting that one of the things about the book of Job is that life itself has a way of overturning some of our convictions of our youth. Carl Jung, the famous Austrian psychologist, put it this way. In the second half of life, the necessity is imposed of recognizing no longer the validity of our former ideals, but of their contraries, of perceiving the error in what was previously our conviction, of sensing the untruth in what was our truth, of weighing the degree of opposition, even hostility, of what we took to be love. And that's what God is teaching Job right now through this whole exercise, helping him to see that his righteousness was an external matter only, and that internally there was a deep and serious problem. That's what's surfacing in Job. God is using this whole experience. It's far more than just a challenge of Satan to teach Job, to bring, out, to bring insight, intimacy to Job. And, and he begins, he began his whole discourse here by revealing his creative wisdom in everything that he made, and in the manifold forces of nature, and uh, so he subjected Job to a penetrating examination of natural subjects. So in chapter 40, I'm just going to take a few verses to review where we finished last time. Chapter, Job chapter 40, starting verse 1, Moreover, the Lord answered Job and said, Shall he that contendeth with the Almighty instruct him? He that reproveth God, let him answer it. In other words, <laughs> who are we to instruct God? That's in fact what Job was in the position of trying to do. Verse 3, And Job answered to the Lord and said, Behold, I am vile. What shall I answer thee? I will lay my hand upon my mouth. Once I have spoken, but I will not answer. Yea, twice, but I will proceed no further. So Job came to the end of the first session with his hand on his mouth. He was silenced, but he wasn't convinced. So God now is going to take up the argument again, and he brings up another matter to Job. Verse 6, Then answered the Lord unto Job out of the whirlwind and said, Gird up thy loins now like a man, and I will demand of thee and declare thou unto me. You see the challenge there. God is saying, again, once again, the same way he did before, telling Job, get ready, we're, we're in a confrontation here. Verse 8, Wilt thou also disannul my judgment? Wilt thou condemn me that thou mayest be righteous? In other words, God is asking Job, can you handle moral government of, on the earth? See, Job has already admitted that he is not in God's league when it comes to understanding the world of nature or caring for the animals. That was the big subject in the last time. And uh, that's where he'd been charging, impl implicitly charging God with a fault. Now, in this next session, God's going to invite Joan, Job, in a sense, rhetorically speaking, to be on the throne of God and see what he would do with the problems that God deals with continually. That's quite a challenge, isn't it? I never thought something like this in the Bible. He just realize what God is really saying here. Verse 9, God says to Job, Hast thou an arm like God? Canst thou thunder with a voice like him? Deck thyself now with majesty and excellency, and array thyself with glory and beauty. Cast abroad the rage of thy wrath, and behold every one that is proud and abase him. Look on every one that is proud and bring him low. Tread down the wicked in their place. Hide them in the dust together and bind their faces in secret. Then will I also confess unto thee that thy own right hand can save you. And so pride is the real issue that's lurking here. 
And uh, so pride, this is already a hint that the real area that's going to start surfacing here is, in, in, as a forthcoming subject, is pride. Not simply the specific animals that he's now about to address. And so God's now going to bring before Job in the discussion two absolutely amazing creatures, a land animal and a sea animal. The first one's a land animal, but he's the ultimate land animal. He's the ultimate land animal. And the second one will be the ultimate sea creature. And we don't recognize him at first because <laughs> this goes back a bit. Now, this is the oldest book in the Bible. That surprises many people. The oldest book of the Bible is not the book of Genesis. The books of Moses, the five books of Moses were written by Moses. He came later. Job was probably about the time of Abraham. So it's the earliest book of the Bible. And it deals with these several unusual creatures. And in the passage, as I point out, there's a dozen animals that we've talked about. There's more space to these two than all the rest of them together, about 44 verses. And one of the questions we have to put in our notes in the back of our mind, why? Why are these so important? Now, the first of these is called a behemoth. That's actually a plural in the Hebrew, meaning beasts, plural. But uh, we'll discover as we look at the behemoth that he is extremely powerful. He's the largest of all the land animals, and he was impossible to capture. Right away, you start, well, gee, who could that be? That's why so many people, well, it must be obviously an elephant. Except he's got a tail like cedars. Have you ever looked at the tail of an elephant? It ain't much. <laughs> okay. Both of these animals are highly feared creatures. They may have been, one possibility, just to get you thinking here, is they may have been chosen to represent ultimate evil. Because these two animals were the most feared animals of their time. The largest land animal that was absolutely ferocious, and the largest sea creature, untamable, uncapturable. We'll see when we get there. And there, but by the way, so you don't think, don't, don't jump to the trap, as some commentators do, that these are mythical creatures of legend or something, that he's just dealing with figures of speech out of legends. No, God describes their diet, their physical strength, their habitat, their fierceness, and makes the point he made them the way they were. So it's clear from the text we're not talking about mythology here. Now some, of course, the behemoth has been uh, characterized by some writers as a hippopotamus or an elephant or a rhinoceros. And, uh, but all of these conjectures are very naive and are easily refuted by the text. And uh, fanciful attempts to render them to any current animals is ludicrous, actually. So I think what we'll do is... Uh, <laughs> Uh, just let the text speak to us and see what it says. Verse 16, God speaking. And by the way, realize we're dealing here with a direct quote from God. All through the scripture, you know, we have it secondhand. Isaiah will tell you what God said or what have you. Here, God is speaking directly. That's interesting. Lo now, his strength is, oh, excuse me, verse 15. Behold now the behemoth, which I made with thee. I made with thee. See, he's putting at the same time that man was created, this creature was created. He eateth grass as an ox. Verse 16, Lo now, his strength is in his loins, and his force is in the navel of his belly. He moveth his tail like a cedar. His sinews of his stones are wrapped together. I love that. His tail is a cedar. Have you ever examined the tail of a hippopotamus or an elephant? It ain't much. So it's a stringy little thing and hardly a cedar. Verse 18, His bones are as strong as pieces of brass. His bones are like bars of iron. He is the chief of the ways of God. He that made him can make his sword to approach him. Chief of the ways of God. You know, that's quite a statement. And it certainly fits the mighty dinosaur. You obviously, uh, everything trembled before them. But I'm going to hint already that there may be more at issue here than the specific dinosaur. God may be using this idiomatically in a much broader sense as we'll discover Verse 20 continues, Surely the mountains bring, forth, bring him forth food, whereas all the beasts of the field play. He lieth under the shady trees in the covert of the reed and the fens. The word fens is an old English word meaning swamps. And they are still there. It may surprise you. 
that in, in the Congo and Zaire, there's a 55,000 square mile swamp. And they have continual reports there of uh, dinosaurs and such, still there. Not quite as large as some of the ones that we have found bones of. But uh, it's astonishing to discover a long list. We'll get to that in a minute here. Verse 22. The shady trees cover them, cover him with their shadow. The willows of the brook compass him about. Behold, he drinketh up a river and hasteth not. He trusteth that he can draw up a Jordan in his mouth. The Hebrew, by the way, it isn't the Jordan River. It's a Jordan in the Hebrew, meaning it's using that as a figure of speech in terms of just speaking of a large amount of rushing water. He can drink up a Jordan. You know, it's like saying he could drink up an Atlantic Ocean or something. It, it sort of is the expression. It's a, just a, a swift running stream that was familiar to them all. It was, it's, in other words, the term is there. It's used idiomatically. He taketh it with his eyes. His nose pierceth through the snares. What we are encountering here could be e very reasonably described as some kind of super serpent. A giant, giant reptile. So one of the things that should trickle in the back of our minds is this might be the Nachash of Genesis chapter 3. Remember the whole story of Adam and Eve. Who came and deceived Eve was a serpent. But see, it was the word in the Hebrew is Nachash, the shining one. As a result of his deceiving Eve and Adam and Eve and getting the fall, he is condemned to, 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 uh, to uh, go on his belly, etc. What was he really? He was the shining one. That's what the term means. Well, we'll talk a little bit more about this as we go. We're now in chapter 41. Let's talk about the second creature, and then we'll stand back and talk a little bit about both of them. We've talked about this land animal. He's obviously a huge, dominant, and, and, and clearly, it's a, the only thing that fits the case is a dinosaur. A real creature, alive at that time, now considered extinct. And that's why people don't think of it or try to fit it, because they don't think of dinosaurs as being actual. They're extinct millions and millions of years ago as, as the fiction gets promoted. Job chapter 41. Now we're going to talk about, having talked about the largest terrestrial animal, land animal, now God describes a kind of sea dragon which is translated from the Hebrew as the Leviathan. Now some, some writers think this refers to a crocodile. Well, <laughs> let me tell you, he's quite a crocodile. And uh, some say it's a whale. And for lots of reasons, if you examine the details, it doesn't fit. That becomes very obvious. Maybe it was a croc whale or something. Anyway. <laughs> In Genesis chapter 1, verse 21, when we're going through the creation account, in verse 21 of the first chapter of the Bible, it says, God created the great whales, every living creature that moveth, which the waters brought forth abundantly, each after their kind, and every winged fowl after his kind. And God saw that it was good. The word translated whales is the, Greek, is the Hebrew word tanin, which is in 20 other places in the Bible translated dragons or sea monsters or serpents. It's translated whales here, but it's a more generic term. You follow me? It doesn't mean, doesn't, not using, it's not speaking of whales denotatively, it's speaking of these large sea creatures or serpents. It's translated dragons. See, right away, you and I, when we hear the word dragon, we immediately, our minds go to mythology, storybooks. We don't think of dragons as being real. That's because we haven't met one. <laughs> okay? See, <laughs> The text, the simple view, look at this and just say, okay, the text is referring to creatures that are now extinct. Except, I'd be misleading you if I left you with that impression because when you get into this area for people who have really studied the dinosaurs, you'll discover that they're not extinct. There's reports continually. We could go through two hours of slides of pictures and newspaper articles and articles out of Scientific American and other journals over the years of sightings by reputable people, groups of people seeing these creatures in different places, uh, sightings of dinosaur-like creatures all over the world, especially in places like the uh, uh, Lekuyala uh, uh, Swamp, 
which is uh, Zaire, is Congo area, 55,000 square miles. That's a huge zone in the middle of Africa. And there's constantly uh, reports there of creatures that uh, you and I would describe as prehistoric. And if you would like, uh, I was originally going to try to show some of those slides, except uh, for lots of reasons, I didn't want to derail the primary study, so I didn't bring the, the, uh, the, the equipment. Do you realize in 1977, a group of Japanese, Japanese fishermen pulled up from 900 feet below the body of a giant pleosaur-like creature. It was 32 feet long and weighed 900 pounds. It was dead, obviously, it was just a carcass. It was almost bigger than the boat they had. So as they picked it up, they took lots of pictures and all of that, but what could they do with it? They ended up ultimately after recording it and taking samples and all that, they put it back. But those pictures are available and uh, we'll put the pictures in the notes that accompany these tapes. But uh, and we'll put a number of the pictures in, in, in the notes that will be with the tapes. But what you and I are going to do now, let's just let the text speak to us. Let's set aside our prejudices and let's hear what the text says in, as, as God continues talking about this. He says, Canst thou, speaking to Job, canst thou draw the Leviathan with, out with a hook or his tongue with a cord which thou lettest down? Canst thou put a hook into his nose or bore his jaw through with a thorn? Will he make many supplications unto thee? Will he speak soft words unto thee? Will he make a covenant with thee? Will thou take him for a servant forever? In other words, can you catch this thing? Can you tame it? Can you make a pet out of it? Hardly. Will thou play with him? Verse 5, play with him as with a bird? Or will thou bind him for thy maidens? Shall the companions make a banquet of him? Shall they part him among the merchants? Canst thou fill his skin with barbed irons? Or his head with fish spears? See, this guy isn't catchable. This isn't something you mess around with. You go out there and catch one with a boat, you know. Lay thy hand upon him and remember the battle. Do no more. <laughs> Behold, the hope of him is in vain. Shall not one be cast down even at the sight of him? None is so fierce that dare stir him up. Who then is able to stand before me? Who hath prevented me that I should repay him? Whoever is under the whole of heaven is mine. I will not conceal his parts, nor his power, nor his comely proportion. Who can discover the face of his garment? Who can come to him with his double bridle? Who can open the doors of his face? His teeth are terrible round about. His scales are his pride, shut up together as a close seal. One is so near the other that no air can come between them. Boy, that's close. They are joined one to another. They stick together. They cannot be sundered. That's neither a crocodile nor a whale, incidentally. Not descriptive at all. By his kneesings, a light doth shine, and his eyes are like the eyelids of the morning. Well, let's just pause. It's clear that whether Leviathan is, he was impregnable, and uh, totally uh, human efforts were insufficient to slay or capture him. And by the way, that can't be a zoo or a crocodile. You know why? Because the zoos are full of them. In fact, hunting them is so successful, they're, ex they're considered uh, endangered species. This character ain't endangered in the traditional sense. Now, just about the time you say, gee, that's pretty good. That must be a dinosaur. I hear you. Check. That's pretty good. Then we get to verses 19, 20, and 21, and is, we get a curveball thrown here. Out of his mouth go burning lamps and sparks of fire leap out. Out of his nostrils goeth smoke as out of a seething pot or cauldron. His breath kindleth coals and a flame goeth out of his mouth. you got to be kidding. The Bible talks about fire-breathing dinosaurs. Certainly this is mythology. Certainly this is just poetic license. Not so. Not so. Let me tell you something that most people don't know about dinosaurs unless you really get into it and talk about the scientists that are dealing with them. They're discovering dinosaur fossils that have been, uh, they've been excavated. They, uh, some of that they found, they show a large protuberance with an internal cavity in the top of the head. And uh, it's been suggested, we don't know what it was for, but you can only guess that it might have served as a mixing chamber for combustible gases that would ignite when exhaled in the presence of oxygen. 
Say, gee, Chuck, that's pretty conjectured. No, there are beetles that do that. There is an interesting creature you should be aware of. You can look it up in the encyclopedia. There's a, a type of ground beetle, Brachinus in North America it's called, and it's a Phorosophus in Africa and Asia. The same creature, just labeled differently. It's of the family of the Caribidae, which is uh, basically the ground beetles. It's well known because it has an internal cavity in which these creatures can secrete a defensive fluid, which when expelled from its posterior, uh, at, the, uh, at the posterior end of the abdomen, it volatizes explosively into a gas <laughs> at high temperature when it comes in contact with the air. It obviously surprises its, any predators around as an explosion. And then there's a smoke cloud that occurs, which allows the beetle to, to escape, given an opportunity to escape from his enemies. It's called the bombardier beetle. And, uh, but it's very interesting because in nature itself, it's got this mechanism by which it mixes. I forgot, I, I couldn't find my diagram in time. I'm going to try to still find it before the notes are published. I forget whether it's one or two, but I think there's two chemicals that get mixed in the chamber. And then when it hits the air, it explodes. It causes a loud pop, an explosion, and there's a cloud of smoke in which the, it so startles the predators that it gives the beetle a chance to escape. Bombardier beetle. And so, um, that, now what, what's so provocative here, suddenly, as we begin to realize there are these kinds of creatures in nature, as we begin to discover these dinosaurs, see what we're all victims of are the, the collective conjectures of museums and others where they take these bones and try to create what they probably looked like. But a lot of that is conjecture laid upon conjecture. So we, the truth of the matter is we're not that sure about a lot of it. And they're discovering that there are this, these chambers and this protuberance they had might be, they don't know what it's might be uh, some apparatus. Now, what's interesting is we stand back now and take a look at history. Um, we, uh, uh, let's talk a little bit about dra dragons throughout history. The word dragon comes from the Greek, uh, the Greek Dracon, which is a, a term that they used, they used to use for any large serpent. That's what the Greek term originally meant. The term dinosaur is derived from the Greek. It means terrible lizard, and it refers to, of course, its large size. Now, the notion that dinosaurs were extinct millions of years ago is a fiction that's been promoted. That certainly doesn't explain the prevalence of dragons throughout literature of all cultures throughout history. And uh, the, uh, the dragon of uh, mythology, whatever shape it might have be, was essentially a serpent with a couple of legs. Two, you know, four legs, uh, even though it was a serpent, it had four legs, typically. In the Middle East, a serpent or dragon was symbolic of evil. Uh, the Egyptian god Apepi was a giant serpent in the world of darkness by, in terms of their mythology. The Greeks and the Romans also at times conceived of Draconites, Dracontis, if you will, of, as, uh, as ben beneficial powers dwelling in the inner parts of the earth. That was their con conception. Their protection, uh, their protective, their, uh, protective uh, features and uh, their terror-inspiring qualities caused them to be adapted as emblems on shields and such in war. The idea of a dragon, they, they adopted that on, sh on, on shields and on ships and so forth. They, remember the ship, some of the ships had a, had a, a prow a, on the bow. Uh, they had a, 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 um, a dragon's head and so forth. The Chaldean dragon, Tiamat, had four legs and a scaly body and wings. Among the most prevalent of, of the dragon legends, of course, is China. The Chinese dragon called a Lung is, was a majestic mythological beast that dwelt in rivers, lakes, oceans, and roamed the skies. They were generally depicted as four-legged animals with scales, a snake-like body, horns, claws, and a large demonic eyes. And they're generally regarded as a source of power, and they were commonly adopted as imperial emblems. The ancient Chinese cosmogonists had, uh, uh, defined four different types. Tian Lung, which was the celestial dragon, he guarded the heavenly dwellings of the gods. The Fu Tsang Lung, which was the dragon of the hidden treasure and Ti Lung, the earth dragon who controls the waterways. And here's the interesting one, the Shen Lung, which was the spiritual dragon who controls the winds and the rain. What's interesting, both the Chinese and the Japanese uh, dragons usually were usually wingless, 
but we're also regarded as being capable of, change their, of changing their size at will, even to the point of becoming invisible. But here's the kick that I was going to get at. What's remarkable is they were referred to as the power of the air. And those of you who know your Bible, that ties together very nicely in terms of who is the prince of the power of the air? Satan. And it's interesting, as you get the book of Revelation, you got the seven seals and the seven trumpets and the seven bowls. But the climax of that whole logarithmic increase of judgment, the last one, the seventh bowl, is poured out what? On the air. Because he's the prince of the power of the air. It's all, all those last are focused right on, this, on Satan's throne. While many of these references uh, to the Leviathan will turn out if you examine closely, uh, uh, could not apply to any animal, even this one. It's possible that what God is alluding to here, metaphorically, is Satan himself. Now let's explain. You know, see, the Leviathan itself was a real animal and not a mythical creature. Don't misunderstand me. In fact, this is clearly asserted in Psalm 104, verse 25, in addition to this passage in Job. God made the Leviathan. He was a literal, real animal on the one hand. In fact, let's go in verse 22. In his neck remaineth strength, and sorrow is turned unto joy before him. The flakes of his flesh are joined together. They are firm in themselves. They cannot be moved. His heart is as firm as a stone, yea, as hard as a piece of nether millstone. And he raised up himself, the mighty are afraid. When he, when he raised up himself, the mighty are afraid. By reason of breakings, they purify themselves. The sword of him that layeth at him cannot hold the spear, the dart, or the habergon. He esteemeth iron as straw and brass as rotten wood. The arrow cannot make him flee. Slingstones are turned with him into stubble. Darts are counted as stubble. He laugheth at the shaking of a spear. Sharp stones are under him. He spreadeth sharp pointed things upon his mire, upon the mire. He maketh the deep to boil like a pot. He maketh the sea like a pot of ointment. He maketh a path to shine after him. One would think the deep to be hoary. Upon earth there is not his like, who is made without fear. He beholdeth the high things. He is a king over all the children of pride. Wow. At this point, we begin to realize, wait a minute. He is what? He is the king over all the children of pride. See, all along now, if we re-examine this passage, we'll discover that God has been interleaving in the, dis in the description of the literal animal, description of this giant sea creature. He's interweaving a description of Satan himself. There are two other places in the scripture where God deals in depth with Satan. But in both cases, what he's doing, he uses a local situation as the mechanism to describe the broader situation. We find that in Isaiah 14 and Ezekiel 28. And uh, I think we have time just to take a quick look at that. Turn to Isaiah uh, 14. It's, a it's one of the classic passages. And it's, it's, uh, it, this is advanced stuff because many people miss this unless they really understand what's happening. Because in Isaiah 14, from um, chapter, from, well, the first part of the chapter, Isaiah is talking about the fallen king of Babylon. And uh, from, from 9 to 11, it's very clear he's talking about the literal king of Babylon. But when you get to verse 12, suddenly the, the uh, 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 expression shifts gears. In verse 12, God is saying through Isaiah, he says, How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of morning? When you encounter that in the chapter, it's almost like a change of subject. God's been talking about this king of Babylon, but now he's shifting to the power that's behind this king. How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? Son of the morning. How art thou cut down to the ground, who didst weaken the nations? For thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit upon the mountain of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the most high. Wow. Many people take that phrase to refer to Satan's attempt to be God. No, he's attempting to be like a God. And I believe Satan saw Adam when he was created as a rival, a potential rival. And that's why he plotted against him. But in any case, uh, verse 7, Yet thou shalt be brought down to Sheol, to the sides of the pit. 
They that see thee shall narrowly look upon thee and shall consider thee saying, is this the man who made the earth to tremble, who did shake the kingdoms, who made the world like a wilderness and destroyed its cities, who opened not the house of his prisoners? And so forth. Very interesting passage, Isaiah 14. There's a similar passage. Obviously, it's a, it's a glimpse into the career of Satan. But there's another passage of Ezekiel. It's, tw- it's not 14, it's 28. In other words, Isaiah 14 and Ezekiel 28. It's easy to remember. There are multiples of each other, both multiples of seven. Here again, we have a situation where God, through Ezekiel, is talking against the king of Tyre. When you get to verse 11 and following, there's a shift of subjects. It's, it's this, he's still focusing on the king of Tyre, except it's as if he's shifting gears. He re, he's reaching in behind the power of the king of Tyre. And, he's, and he says to Ezekiel, the son of man, verse 12, take up a lamentation against the king of Tyre and say unto him, thus saith the Lord God, thou sealest up the sum full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. That's awkward Hebrew. In other words, he is the sum, the peak of beauty. He is, he is the ultimate answer is what it's saying. That's strange because he's, you know, he's, he's, you seal up the sum. You're full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. Thou hast been in Eden. Now, wait a minute. The king of Tyre wasn't in Eden. It's a throwback into Genesis chapter 3. Thou hast been in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone was thy covering. The sardius, the topaz, the diamond, the barrel, the onyx, the jasper, the sapphire, the emerald, the carbuncle, and gold, the workmanship of thy timbrels and thy flutes was prepared in the day that thou was created. It's a created being we're talking about here. Now here's the key verse, verse 14. Thou art the anointed cherub. There are angels, there are super angels. A cherub is the top of the heap. He is, he was, the anointed cherub that covereth. That's a way of clumsy translation. He is the, he's a cherub, not just an angel, he's a cherub. But he's the one that was appointed to be in charge of all the rest of them. That's what that really implies. Who is that? That was Satan before he fell. Thou was the anointed cherub that covereth. I have set thee so. Thou wast upon the holy mountain of God. Thou hast walked up and down in the midst of the stones of fire. Thou wast perfect in the ways from the in thy way. Thou was perfect in thy ways from the day that thou was created until iniquity was found in thee. The untils in the Bible are worth making a catalog of. Whenever you see an until, that's typically a milestone of some kind. He was perfect in the, in, from the day he was created until, oh boy, iniquity is found. That's where sin began, was in his heart, in his pride. That's why God hates pride, because it was through pride that Satan fell, and it was through pride that all the rest, all earth's evils derive from. By the multitude of thy merchandise, they have filled the midst of thee with violence. Thou hast sinned, therefore I will cast thee out profane, uh, as profane, out of the mountain of God. And I will destroy thee, O covering cherub, from the midst of the stones of fire. Thine heart was lifted up because of thy beauty. Thou hast corrupted thy wisdom by reason of uh, thy brightness. I will cast thee to the ground. I will lay thee before kings that they may behold thee. Thou hast defiled thy sanctuaries by the multitude of thine iniquities. By the iniquity of thy merchandise, therefore will I bring forth a fire from the midst of thee, and it will devour thee, and I will bring thee to ashes upon the earth in the sight of all them that behold thee. All that know thee among the people shall be appalled at thee. Thou shalt be a terror, and never shalt thou be any more. That's obviously looking way, way ahead. I mention these two places because I think they're uh, analogous to what we're encountering in Job. Because I think Job is ta- uh, I think God is talking indeed about a literal Leviathan on the one hand, and yet the language reaches beyond that. So one of the things you want to be sensitive to, you have to come to your own conclusions about this, is that it seems to be much more in view here than simply an earthly creature. There may be, the real point here is a spiritual application. So let's step back. Uh, we look at these creatures. So, you know, some people think these creatures are mythical and legendary, like the unicorn or like dragons. But while they may have actually been real cre- uh, creatures, They also may be being used here symbolically about that which is invisible and supernatural. And as I say, Scripture has many examples of this all through Scripture. We looked at uh, Isaiah and Ezekiel, but we find the same thing in Daniel. We find the same thing in Zechariah. We find the same thing in the Revelation. They're all full of examples of beasts 
that rise up um, and out of the sea or out of the earth that signify far more than any just creature. There's something much, they're, they, they're, they're uh, idiomatic of something much larger, movements or leaders, invisible or supernatural powers. An example of this occurs in Isaiah 27, verse 1. In Isaiah 27, verse 1, we have a Leviathan talked about. In, the, in that day, the Lord, verse, Isaiah 27, verse 1, in that day the Lord, with his sore and great strong sword, shall punish Leviathan the piercing serpent, even Leviathan that crooked serpent, and he shall slay the dragon that is in the sea. What's he talking about? He's not just talking about the last of the dinosaurs. He's using that idiomatically of something far deeper. The Hebrew names and all these things are very significant. The word behemoth for the land animal is actually the plural for beasts. And it, and it thus suggests maybe all the beasts lumped together, although here clearly the text is, is being very specific. Probably a brachiosaurus is the opinion of most experts, uh, idiomatic, if you will, of what we commonly call dinosaurs. The Leviathan, the term actually in the Hebrew means the folded one. The folded one. Or I might say the twisted one, okay? Um, one that's the twisted or folded serpent. He's called the, the dragon of the sea in Isaiah. Now, we notice here in Job, we have something very interesting going on. We have God speaking of two super animals. One of the land, one of the sea, right? When you get to Revelation 13, there are two beasts that rise. One from the earth and one from the sea. I'll actually just put the other around. The first one comes out of the sea and the second one comes from the earth. But behind, and there clearly in the book of Revelation, they are governments or leaders or, or uh, actually personages leading large governments and so forth. But behind each of these is also identified in the chapter of Rish Prior, the one that's really behind him. In Revelation chapter 12, verse 9 and 10, you may want to look that up, it speaks of that old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world. He was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. And we know from that passage there was a third of them that went, got cast out with him. In the next verse, though, it also identifies Satan with his main title. What does the word Satan really mean? He's the accuser of our brethren. The accuser of our brethren is cast down, which accused them before God day and night. Satan has been accusing Job in this book, and Satan right now is accusing us before the throne. He is our accuser. That's what the word really means. You know, it really alarms me when I see Christian leadership attack other Christian leaders, especially in public. There is a procedure in the scripture in Matthew 18 that if you have something odd against a brother, you go to him in private first. If that doesn't go, you go to him in private with, with an elder with you. If that doesn't work, you go to his board. You don't parade this out in public that dishonors God. That's called accusing the brethren. Where does that doctrine come from? From Satan, exactly right. It really disturbs me to see some who make their career publicly attacking other members of the body. Now, it's a very valid ministry to take a false teaching that's been published and compare it to the Bible and show how it's non-biblical. Walter Martin and others, there have been some great men in the past that have been skilled at that, but they always focused on what was taught by what was published and what the Bible says. It wasn't made interpersonal, never attacked an individual. It's become very fashionable by several people publicly to write books or have, have a talk show programs or whatever, attacking prominent members of the body of Christ that we may not agree with everything. They may have different views about certain things. They love Jesus Christ. They are brethren in the Lord, independent of some difference of view we might have. We don't attack them publicly. Why? Because that's Satan's work. <coughs> Satan's work. I won't ask for a show of hands of how many you want to be about Satan's work. <laughs> that's not our job, is it? And... Uh, we have a policy in our ministry not to comment on any ministries, just to make sure that we're clean on that point. We may talk about false teaching, that such and such a view is not biblical, and here's why. That's a different thing. 
That's different than accusing the brethren. And it's disturbing about that. You know, it's interesting that Satan's work is to accuse us before the throne. God may allow Satan to test us the way God allowed Satan to test Job. He put him through a real ringer here. But Job did pretty well. He had a lot to learn. And one of the most instructive things about the book of Job is to go through it and notice how Job grows. His perspective, his perceptions grow and yet get continually corrected. Remember, Christ um, allowed Satan to test Peter. You remember, in, in, uh, it's in Luke 22, verse 31, 32. The Lord said, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan hath desired to have you, that he may sift you as wheat. But I have prayed for thee that thy faith fail not. When thou art converted, strengthen thy brethren. When thou, he isn't converted yet, he will be. But it's interesting, he didn't pray that Peter, he didn't pray that Peter wouldn't fail. He prayed that Peter's faith wouldn't fail. That's the key issue. That's the key issue. And you know why we can't fail? If Satan's our prosecutor, who is our defense counsel? Jesus Christ. He's our defense counsel. Hebrews 7.25, he prays Jesus' job daily. It's to pray for you. Man, you want a prayer partner? <laughs> you can't beat that one. He ever liveth to make intercession for us. Hebrews 7.25, when you want to remember. Also, 1 John 2, the first couple of verses. Jesus is our advocate. We've got the thing wired because we have the Creator Himself on our side. And that's pretty good odds. Well, we've talked about the anointed cherub in Ezekiel. That, of course, is Nachash, the shining one of Genesis 3. And again, it's the serpent thing. Okay, we've talked about these two animals in a, in a, uh, in a uh, zoological sense, tangible, real animals, and they were. We've touched a little bit on the idea that these may be used idiomatically to speak of satanic aspects. But there's another level of possibility here that I want to leave you with. The behemoth is being presented as being very self-sufficient. And we can go back and look at verses 15 through 18 to do that, but in the interest of time, I'll just uh, let you do that. But I want you to notice um, verse 19. In the King James, the way we read it, it says, He is the chief of the ways of God. He that made him can make his sword to approach to him. The Hebrew in that verse, the Hebrew in Job is very difficult, by the way. That's why many different experts have slightly different translations as they try to grapple with what the Hebrew is really saying. The um, uh, New English Bible uh, describes this a little differently. He renders verse 19, He is the chief of God's works, made to be a tyrant over his peers. So here's an animal that is being presented as uh, or seeming to stand for the desire to rule over everyone else, a tyranny over all. It can be, you can think of the behemoth as, as the exemplar of self-confidence, self-sufficiency, self-centeredness. And there's no better description of the enemy that you and I have within us. It's called the flesh. You can look, if you will, at the behemoth in a sense as typifying, idiomatically uh, speaking, of the flesh. It's a genetic defect that we have from Adam. Adam was a direct creation of God, but you and I are derivative, named the natural, of Adam. We have a genetic defect. It's called the flesh. It's called sin, propensity for sin. That's why God speaks of the conversion as a new birth, a new creation. He came unto his own, and his own received him not. But as to many as received him, to them gave he the power to become the sons of God, the Benai HaElohim, the, the, uh, the direct creation of God. So, okay, let's take another look at the Leviathan. It also may be being presented to go beyond the zoological uh, characteristics. And it may allude metaphorically to, uh, to, uh, to uh, uh, him that is a, of a malevolent evil spirit. It says, he beholdeth all things. He is the king over the children of pride, you know. And again, this, as I pointed out, the second, secondary illusion thing is something that we see several times in the career, uh, allude to the career of Satan. He's certainly the father 
of the children of pride. And of course, the book of Revelation, Satan is presented as the red dragon. And uh, this is also picked up in the prophecies of Isaiah. In uh, Well, we saw that in Isaiah 27, when we saw that when he spoke, that he's going to slay the dragon that is in the sea. In the book of Revelation, just so we tie off our friend, <laughs> I hope he's not a friend, um, uh, the red dragon here, Revelation chapter 20, John says, I saw an angel come down from heaven having the key to the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand. And he laid hold on the dragon, that old serpent, which is the devil and Satan, and bound him for a thousand years and cast him into the bottomless pit and shut him up and set a seal upon him that he should deceive the nations no more until a thousand years should be fulfilled. And after that, he must be loosed a little season. And of course, we know the story. That's called the millennium. There's going to be a thousand year period on the earth where man is without excuse. Everything's going to be perfect. There'll be no shortages. God himself will be ruling with a rod of iron. Uh, Satan will be bound. Man has no excuse. And the earth will be full of the knowledge of the Lord. There'll be no ignorance of the Lord. And under those ideal conditions, it seems, man is still ready to rebel. At the end of the thousand years, Satan's turned loose and man blows it again. God's final test, his final demonstration of what we're really all about. But fortunately, when you get to Revelation 20, we don't stop at verse 3. You skip down to verse 10. It says, And the devil that deceived them, the end, was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and the false prophet are and shall be tormented day and night forever and ever. So Satan, ultimately, after the thousand years, will also get his due. It's interesting that at the front end, when the second coming occurs, the beast and the false prophet, these two beasts of Revelation 13, are cast into the lake of fire. Satan's not. He's bound for a thousand years in the buso, in the abyss. One thousand years later, after there's a rebellion and God finally puts that all down, Satan is thrown into the lake of fire. But the beast and the false prophet are still there, still burning, still being tormented. There's no annihilation concept here. See, it's outside the dimensionality of time. They are, uh, it, it, there's, there's no, there's, there, it's, it's, it's forever without hope. We can't imagine that. We can't imagine that. Well, anyway, let's uh, tie this off. <laughs> there really is a dragon that we need to be concerned with. And it's far more dangerous than any cloned dinosaur of Jurassic Park fame. We all remember the, the famous, the, the very colorful, very provocative fiction by uh, Michael Crichton, his, his novel that was made into a movie, the, you know, Jurassic Park. There's something far more, there's a, there is a, a, a dragon far more dangerous than any of those. But the good news is, even that dragon, his destiny is sealed. How is that destiny sealed? By an empty tomb that we celebrate on Easter morning. Jesus has assured the final victory. So the next time somebody brings up dinosaurs, then why not really get into it? So they want to talk about dinosaurs. Now you can you know, organize some of your notes on here and you can really get into it. Remember, he brought it up, right? And, uh, it's a great witnessing opportunity if we do our homework. So in chapter 41, we encounter the Leviathan a water animal that may also infer to an untamable world system. And uh, I want you to compare Isaiah, uh, uh, Job 41, the first half a dozen verses, with Revelation 17, the whore that sits on many waters that are identified, the waters there are identified as peoples, multitudes, nations, and tongues. This world system, how the Leviathan may be referring to how, how unconquerable it is. It's, it's interesting that uh, you know God in, interjects sort of a, a parenthetical challenge in verses 10 and 11 there in chapter 41. That's almost analogous to Jeremiah's quip in Jeremiah 12, verse 5. He says, If thou hast run with footmen and they have wearied thee, how canst thou contend with horses? But God is saying to Job, If you can't contend with these, how can you contend with a larger issue? That's really the thought that's behind that. And God deals with it all the time. How's Job going to do that? And so... Uh, so God goes ahead and you know uh, amplifies the Leviathan's ability to defend itself. It obviously, you know, is analogous to a deeply entrenched, well-defended system that can't be overthrown. The world system, 
and uh, awesome fearless and fighting power, invulnerable and irresistible. The key attribute of the world system is pride. And that's also the Leviathan. He's the king of all the sons of pride. Well, anyway, what, what's happened to Job here by now is Job is, uh, God has brought Job up to the point to an awareness that the very things that Job has in his own heart and life, they describe forces over which he has no control. I say that again. These are the very things that Job has in his own heart and in his life. These are forces over which he alone, unaided, has no control. So at this point, God has made it very clear to Job that, that what we were informed of at the very beginning of the book, we were told that there was a satanic challenge going on here. Job didn't know that then. See, behind his sickness and behind his protracted agony, there was an intense struggle with the satanic power. Job didn't know that. We knew it because we were tipped off in chapter 1 what was really going on. Job didn't know that. All he knew is everything was turning pretty, pretty rough. But God is teaching Job that there's something much deeper. And, uh, but now at last, Job is given a strong hint that the reason behind his illness is not his own failure or his own willful misdeeds, but a more serious problem that's embedded in his very nature that he wasn't even aware existed. And yet that very thing is destroying him. That's what God has to deal with uh, with Job, and this is what he has to deal with us, in us. So Job's first reaction will be, in the next chapter, the Klein chapter, a new view of God himself. And that will be our concluding topic next time. It's going to be, I think next time is a, is a short chapter, but it's a good opportunity. We're going to review the, really understand what God has been doing to Job throughout these 42 chapters and what he intends to do with us. Because our problems are not external, they're internal. Our problems are with ourselves. Job's problem was not the loss of his possessions and the loss of his family and his illness. It was himself in his heart. And God's using this whole experience to teach Job some things that he could not learn any other way. And it's very, if, 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 you, um, if you want to get into this subject personally and very practically, say, gee, Chuck, uh, how, do I, how do I deal with, I'm going through a dark time. I'm, I've got this, that, and the other thing. You list, God is, I, I'm really in a dark, dark period. Uh, how do I deal with that practically? I have a suggestion. My wife has written a book called Faith in the Night Seasons. She deals with, the, what some people call the dark night of the soul and similar things. God uses that time. Nothing can happen to you that he doesn't allow. And he, the question is, why is he allowing it? Well, there's lots of possible reasons, but one of which is that it's his way of drawing you into more intimacy with him. And if you want to understand what that really means and how to really deal with that in real terms, in real life, with real while you're undergoing real darkness, real hurts, uh, I encourage you to take a look at the book. I was quite startled when the, the well-known theologian John Ankerberg called that book God Breathed. That's a very unusual thing for him to say about any book. And uh, yet he did uh, have that reaction to Faith in the Night Seasons. I encourage you to take a look at that. But next time we will uh, summarize the whole book of Job. And I can tell you candidly, it'll probably be full of surprises because some of the common Summaries of the book of Job are not on the mark. Uh, if, if Job is about far more than why do the innocent suffer, it's about the reality of God and our relationship to him and far deeper. Nowhere in God's dialogue at the climax of the book from chapters 38 through 42 does God deal with why do the innocent suffer in the, in the sense that we would normally think.